streetcars made the neighborhood possible. The automobile made it possible for people to leave. And the highway nearly destroyed the community. It would be hard to underestimate the impact of the construction of the interstate highway system on the city of Columbus or any American city for that matter. Think about thousands and thousands and thousands of buildings being demolished to make way for the freeway. Two major, major thoroughfares came through the community and separated them and became physical, like boundaries for these neighborhoods. It cut this neighborhood off from the north, the south, the, the east, and the west. And I think that kind of changed this whole atmosphere. People left, left homes that were good to live in. The suburbs exploded in, in the post-World War II generation, and that's where people thought life was better. Families now were being presented with all those choices of the little house, the yard to raise their children in, and the fact it was a two-car family. Huge numbers of people begin to leave the old city and depart for the new suburbs, some considerable distance away from downtown. As they do so, those older neighborhoods go through a variety of transitions, some revitalizing themselves, some restoring themselves, some not, some deteriorating. People start leaving. Everybody wants something newer and bigger or smaller or more modern. And as they leave, then the businesses suffer because there's now shopping further out. When business moves away, then those buildings are vacant. And without residential or enough residential, it doesn't anchor a community through the hard times. People moving into a neighborhood create demand, and they want to be able to get to a store. They want a market. They want different services. They want restaurants, and they'll patronize them. You got to have that because, you know, it doesn't make any difference how much stuff you've got there. If nobody's going, it's not going to stay. In the age of the suburb, no one wanted a mansion with 10-foot ceilings. Some were abandoned. Some were turned into nursing homes, churches, or apartments. Homeowners were disappearing. Owners didn't want to be here any longer. They wanted to move out to the suburbs. And that's what they did. So they left a lot of uninhabited property that became rental property. And that's how we ended up with this mix of people that we didn't know. When you have a high rental rate, you have a, a large transit population and that transit population generally do not have the same values, values in terms of ownership. They don't have as much interest in participating in the neighborhood activities. There were a lot of absentee landlords that could care less about our neighborhood. You know, they lived in the suburbs and they owned the property and all they were interested in was a quick cash flow and they didn't put any money back into their properties. And that's just, just sad that people didn't stay here to protect this. Absentee landlords and indifferent city officials could have been a fatal blow to the neighborhood. Instead, these dark days opened the door to a possibility that might offer hope. Across the nation, people in older communities were given a tool to preserve what had been built. The 1960s really was when the American preservation movement kicked into high gear. And that really came about with the passage of the National Historic Preservation Act in 1966, which set up a national preservation program. Some neighborhoods are going to have highly restrictive preservation controls put in place. They're going to become historic districts in one form or another. Other neighborhoods don't go that way. They simply form organizations or working with existing neighborhood organizations. Old Town East is an example of that kind of revitalization. 